So we're, uh, yeah, the uh, debut episode of Mental Health Matters. It's, uh, I was looking forward to getting this uh, podcast back off the ground for Phoenix FM, and it was a, an idea close to my heart because of you know my, I guess, background, as all of our backgrounds really have a journey of uh, getting to know ourselves and feeling better and... Yes. <laughs> And working out what we're doing, really. Absolutely. And uh, so it's just a good idea to find ways of helping people and uh, to meet people that are doing the same thing. And so uh, I have the great pleasure of being joined by yourself. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's <laughs> a great pleasure being with here with you and having a chance to talk about these things. So. Yeah, Elizabeth Tapini, if I pronounced that correctly. Yes, Elizabeth Tapini. Yes. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we're here in uh, Tufnell Park, and um, yeah, just uh, so I came here because uh, when I was thinking about people to speak to about this, you know, I was uh, you know thinking about all the uh, wonderful people I know that are you know working with mental health or specifically mm. in psychology or mm. uh, psychiatry or and uh, to share their experience and their knowledge really and how they're doing it, and so uh, came to mind to speak to you, and uh, so you're here on the debut episode, so it's a r- privilege to be able to speak to you about it. And so I guess as the outline for it, for the episode and for the idea of the mm-hmm. podcast is Mental Health Matters. But we can start by finding out about yourself. And, uh, well, um, that's a good start, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why I chose to spoke, speak to you. So uh, mm. yeah, this was just a, a bit of a background. To, to yes. You. Yeah, I guess uh, the first thing that I would give as a background is that it uh, It wasn't my first profession. It, w- it became my second profession, and it's an ongoing uh, second profession. And I came as everybody that is interested in uh, this area out of a quest about my own self. Mm. I remember always my professor back when I was doing the BSc. He was a professor of psychiatry, and he had given us some statistics that it's around... 80%, 85% between something ridiculous, like 80% or 90%. I can't remember the stats. Yeah, it's been like 20 years. Mm. But uh, that this is the this is kind of the, the percentage kind of um, side of things as to who gets involved in, uh, in these professions. That usually people start from having to face something themselves. Yeah. And I'm no exception. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no exception. Uh, and uh, yes, back in the day, the, my professor was referring to social workers, psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists. If you think about it, it's all the the gamut of the helping professions, you know, one way or the other. There are differences in what you can do with people, or what sort of authority you have in terms of pres- uh, prescribing medication or not. Yeah. But there is kind of this common denominator of the wounded healer yeah. that wants to do good. Yeah, exactly. Well, that applies to all the medical professions, really, doesn't it? Exactly. Yeah, especially in the West. Yes, uh, yes. And I would say not only in the West. It's just like uh, that it changes in the East how people would be approaching this. But uh, okay. Uh, for me, I think that even in the East, people start from some sort of quest about themselves. Maybe not with the same intensity that we in the West do. That's Okay. But they, they will have to start from themselves to actually engage with that kind of alternative medicine or, uh, you know, Buddhist informed practice or whatever it is. Yeah. So what was the turning point for you in terms of the uh, career change or the step into it? Well, I guess uh, I need to just link it with my previous profession. Yeah. Uh, because that was my, my attempt to see how I could bridge this two together somehow yeah uh initially at least i i trained and i worked as an actress in my 20s and although you know they seem like completely different paths if you think about it or at least you know the way that i experienced it back then it was that whenever i had to impersonate a role Mm -hmm. i had to actually try to get into the other person's shoes yeah so to speak so to me that was kind of the the first aha experience i had as you know as a, as a trainee actress not even as a full fully qualified actress that at some point i was given a piece a role and uh i i realized that i had to actually extract my own trauma in order to actually work with the role uh. and and i found that extremely therapeutic without even having the language of therapeutics or psychology or psychotherapy or what have you. Yeah. So I think that planted the seed yeah. back then, if you know what I mean. 
And then I, you know, I faced uh, what I would call uh, for brevity, I guess, and some confidentiality of my own story, yeah. an existential crisis. Okay. You know, as to where am I going with life? Okay, you know, this uh, engagement with art is great, but I'm not... Um, I'm not progressing the way that I want to. I wa yeah, I want to. And yeah. uh, also in terms of finances. And uh, I was trying to find a way to get to help people for sure. But it's, I think that at that point, it was more to do with finding a way to help myself. Yeah. And uh, I reached out for help and uh, I went into therapy myself. Uh, it wasn't successful from the beginning. Yeah. You know, and I think that this is also something else that will, you know. Yeah come out of our discussion later yeah. on as well. My first uh, therapist was not even properly qualified. Uh, I didn't right. even know that. And But all these kind of steps in that process, you know, it got me more involved with also some leisurely reading around psychological theories and things like that. I was always a bookworm since I was yeah. a kid anyway. Okay. So that, that started, you know, bringing the two together. And um, in my process of finding myself, then I started uh, voluntarily helping others, like in community groups and things like that. Yeah. Uh, becoming a mentor for others, helping people finding uh, their way back into employment or back to education and things like that. Mm -hmm. People with addictive behaviors, things like that. But again, as a volunteer, you know, yeah. I was just trying to get enough knowledge and see how I can bring things together, really, without starting a new life path or professional path and then ending up not liking it, so to speak. That's a great idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it helps. Yeah, and yeah. I, and I think that that's something that... You can apply that to any change of life, really. And yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, that's why, you know, apart from politics, uh, whatever, uh, I think volunteering is always a great idea. Okay, yeah. we're not getting paid, but you, you get an opportunity to, to actually familiarize yourself with something before you actually really invest in that. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that was the way I did it. And then I went to uni when I was 24, 25. Okay. Which, I mean, now it sounds funny that I'm saying that I had life experience, you know, now, <laughs> you know, uh, in, uh, in my mid-40s. But uh, back then, compared to the other students, yeah, I did of have... There's a big difference between 24 and being 18. Exactly, I, yeah. exactly. So I, I just... Uh, acquired the status straight away that I could associate knowledge with some life experience. Yeah, and see how you could apply it or, you know, the basis of it. Yes, and uh, I found it much easier to study as well, relate theories to actual uh, experience that I had in my life or I had come across through others and things like that. Mm -hmm. So from Gestalt psychology, uh, going back to, you know, the, the psychology of perception, let's say, you know, what stays in the figure, what comes to the foreground yeah. and how things are changing. You know, I, I, could, I had like a little life experience behind me to actually associate these things yeah, with something. Great. Or with social psychology, yeah. I'm just going through before you become a therapist, you, you, you know, in the first uh, BSc kind of level, you get exposed to every kind of psychology and then you get specialized into counseling, clinical mm -hmm. psychology or psychotherapy. That's one of the roots. Yeah. You know, psychology can, can be done in the lab, can be experimental, can be to do with social groups. You know, there, there are many different things. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that's how things developed, really. And the more I got engaged with knowledge, again, you know, in a, in a kind of a formalized way, yeah. the more I realized that my initial idea of bringing the arts into therapy, let's say, doing either a drama therapy masters or a dance therapy movement masters, things like that, it sounded a great idea initially, yeah. but if I were to stay also true to myself and being able to actually help others, well, I needed to recognize in myself that when I want to be on stage, I want to be in, on stage and perform. Yeah. I, I don't want to therapize anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I kept those things separate. Yeah. It's only now, and I guess that's going to, you know, fold out as we're talking later yeah. on. That's something that now, you know, after close to 15, 16 years of practice. Now I'm thinking of how I can bring that back. But initially, I just kept that separate. And then I started getting more experience uh, with talking therapy in particular and trying to see how people respond to that first as a trainee 
and then uh, as a qualified chartered psychologist and then an existential psychotherapist. That was the way I did it. Okay. That's the way that, uh, just repeat what you said, like in terms of, uh, yeah, that's uh, how it happened. But it's like your own unique path based on at each point, you're very true to yourself. You were aware of how you were at each, at each point of your life. And that dictated the steps you, te- you took. It wasn't just the very linear this degree, that degree, yeah, not at all. PhD, yes. and then just keep going. So you just literally, you know, at which point where to turn and what you wanted to do next. Yes. And this uh, helped you fine tune and sharpen your skills and provide a quite a, in some ways, a unique way of Approaching helping. it, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. And helping others as well, for sure, for yeah. sure, for sure. Thank you for saying that. I mean, it, it, you 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 made it appear as you know like a continuous achievement process. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's probably like that in hindsight, or from my perspective, as you yeah, described yes. it, uh, yes. in terms of the, uh, the you know the, the turns you took. Yes. But I'm sure at each moment, at some points, it, you probably couldn't see the wood from the trees, or it wasn't that clear yes, as to yes, what the yes, turn yes, was going to yes, be. Yeah, you know, I had like moments of proper turmoil, especially yeah. when that initial idea of bringing the arts and using arts as the therapeutic medium, then I realized that, no, this cannot happen for me at this stage. Yeah. That was a very turmoilous moment, for sure. But um, I think I managed to actually turn that around pretty quickly. I didn't do it alone. It wasn't yeah. just my perseverance and my determination and bringing, you know, my life experience in it. Yeah. You know, it had also to do that I was in therapy myself and you know, I was exploring what was happening for me whilst I was, you know, checking these other options and trying to stay true to myself in order to be able to help others be true to themselves via Yeah, I mean, work. that's a, a trick in itself is to be true to yourself because sometimes you don't even know what you want. I mean, I feel like that in the past. Or, you know, there's mm. times, that, uh, as you know, when I wasn't feeling so good and this might be a bit of a theme in mm. some of the episodes is uh, knowing when to ask and who to ask and what to ask for that bit of help. And just by yes. taking those first steps, as I discovered, that's when the right things come to you. And then through that process of asking and, you know, learning, then you kind of fine tune or tune, or tune into what mm. you, you like and and what, what will work for you in terms of steps forward. Absolutely, because it's a, it's a very individual journey. It's a personal yeah. journey. <laughs> yeah. you know, finding yourself, it's a very, very personal journey. Yeah. And uh, humans operate with language, with ideas, with different approaches around things and it can get it can get quite confusing initially that yeah. uh, you're thinking okay now i know what i want and then when you actually engage with that then you realize that yes it's still what i want but perhaps i need a slightly different approach yeah. with this let's say yeah. you know i talked about this you know using the art as therapeutics or not but it's it's also when when uh, i started being more engaged in the theories or the therapeutic approaches that I can use. Yeah. That was, again, something that recalibrated both my thinking and my soul, you know, as to how I can actually help others. Yeah. And that also came from, uh, you know, the first experience of therapy not being that great. Right. And realizing through that experience that I need to be very, very careful as to you know, my own personal and professional ethics when I do this, yes. right? So, you know, that, that was one thing. The other was that perhaps this approach, you know, just looking at the past and not necessarily also seeing how you're relating with, you know, with your difficulties or your aspirations or a combination of both, usually yeah. it's a combination of both. Yeah. We need also the lenses of the present because yeah. otherwise you might just get stuck in a loop of justifying yourself or of not moving forward because... Yeah. You're just thinking that, okay, yeah, this terrible thing happened to me back yeah. in the day. And if I keep talking about that with my therapist, so I can never claim responsibility in the presence of changing things. Yeah, Do you because know what I mean? you, can, you can, by giving the attention to it all the time and talking about it, you're still there. Yes. You're not yes. where you are now. You're exactly. not able to change the way you're doing things now, which will then help you mm. move forward. Mm. You're, kind of, you're, you're keeping a foot stuck in yes. the past. So yeah, th- th- that's what I've been learning as well is that mm. I've like, it's actually when I stopped giving attention to some of the things I was being regretful about or thinking about too much is when I was addressing how I am now and what am I doing? What, what can I improve right now? Mm. That's when things really started changing quite quickly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it's not that the past should not be revisited, for sure. Yeah. But it's 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 a matter of of gravity, you know, how much you put, you know, if if we if we are to visualize yeah. like a 
an old fashioned pair of scales, like with two plates. It's, yeah. it, you need to have a balance in how you, you're doing this. If you're just focusing on the past, then you're not going, then your scales are going to be completely tilted and you won't be able to actually see how, how you can engage differently in the present. Yeah. But if you, if you go just in the present yeah. and you say, it doesn't matter what happened to me at all, yeah. you're in denial. Really. Yeah, yeah. You cannot actually pull the thread and see, see how that relates to now but you still have the opportunity to engage differently with the words. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's a fine-tuning kind of exercise. Yeah. Since we're full of equipment around us, you know, we can <laughs> use a metaphor, I guess. Yeah, exactly, yes. yeah, turning all the dials and everything. Yes, exactly. But what I noticed, yeah. actually, uh, especially more recently, was it was how I changed what I'm doing now and uh, the difference in perception, which helped me address things in the past. So it's almost like that way mm. around. Yes, where uh, I, I would just change my perspective on the past. And then, you know, because there's that expression of, you know, just have to forgive or let go. But I was able to actually see how that works by by dealing with that in the present, by, mm. by uh, knowing how I can, you know, move forward more positively and realize that it just, you know, what are the st- steps I take now, it's almost like what you're doing now, you can change the past to a degree or how you perceive it, which yes. will then help you deal with it, basically. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. It's just that with this thing that sometimes when we, when we just go straight away to forgive and let yeah, go, yeah. That, that, that's 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 always what I, you know, I address with caution when yeah, people of course. are saying this because it, it can easily. It seems the way you you are describing your own experience that you you did your own fine tuning. Yeah, you you didn't just uh, say okay, you know. It, it did not happen. Yeah, well, you can't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah but loads of people do that mistake, and then it just ends up being suppressed and is yes. <laughs> not yeah. dealt with. And so, yes, so, and yeah. then it will just sprout in a different way. You yeah. know, it might be you know come out in a different symptom or something else. Exactly. If you're just saying no, you know, oh yes, I have a very forgiving nature, or no, you know, I can live and let live, or yeah, you yeah. know, let go and uh, you know, just be above things. Yeah. You know that that can. Uh, There's a bit of CBT fire. that deals with uh, you know, changing behavior patterns, but somehow not uh, mm. addressing the roots of them, perhaps. And there's, there's, you know, elements exactly. to it which are useful, which is actually looking into the CBT was a way that I kind of, one mm. of the steps I took mm. to a... Well, me too at some point, but yeah. uh, it's it's interesting you're raising that because that's something that always stirs up big conversation also with my students, my, okay. my psychotherapy trainee students, that the CBT can be extremely helpful in in cases where something interferes, a particular symptoms uh, interferes with your everyday function to the degree that it doesn't let you function. Yeah. Let's say somebody has severe agoraphobia and they cannot leave the house. Yeah. Or, or they, yeah, or they suffer from panic attacks or, you know, something, something to do with phobias. I would, I would keep it around that because depression is much more complicated, according to me at least. In those cases, of course, you're going to start with CBT mm. because you need to get rid of that symptom that is, or at least the intensity of that symptom, so the person can actually engage again with the world before you actually go into more nuanced stuff and you know checking around the past and etc. That's a good idea. Yeah. So there, there is an element to it. It's, it's like a, a tool in the box, as it were. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But the mistake that people do uh, quite frequently, because it, it has become a little bit like the ideology of our times, the CBT also, you know, it's, it's very much promoted in the NHS. And, you know, it has definitely helped a lot of people to access services. And that's, you know, the IAPT services that they're talking about is improved access to psychological therapies. For sure, it allowed more people to actually engage. It, uh, it's it's uh, shorter uh, waiting lists and things like that. But at times, it just stays only as the only tool in the toolbox. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> and it cannot be enough. Because if you, if you just stay uh, on that kind of surface level, eliminating the symptom, but without actually checking how that applies to the rest of somebody's story, mm. then it's very, very possible that a symptom might come, a different symptom might come up in a different way well, it's later. it's natural because it's like, uh, yeah, you're suppressing something which is trying to get out. Or, exactly. Or if it's not trying to get out, at least it's... To it's, express it's something. Yeah, yeah, to yeah. express something. Yeah. And, uh, and this is where, you know, the more kind of individual touch is quite important. You know, what, what is the personal meaning of somebody's story? You know, the, my, if I were to suffer from panic attacks, there would be 
different from your panic attacks. Yes. They would be having common characteristics, like, you know, if you have to go to the diagnostic manual, you know, it says tick box, this, 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 yes, that, that's, both these people have a panic attack. But what is my story behind that? How do I relate to losing control and the notion of, you know, being out of balance or whatever it is? It's very different to yours. Yeah. And you know, I'm just using our, ourselves as examples. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but also that kind of brings me back to, your journey is to getting to here is for what in hindsight it seems like a very smooth kind of transition but it's also what you've gone through are steps are of a knowledge of other tools yes. in the toolbox as it were so yes. you know you're able to have that awareness of mm. how cbt for example could be useful or not useful in that way and then these other techniques as mm. well and so yes. you've you've given yourself a broad spectrum yes. of yes, things absolutely. to apply when you absolutely. Uh, so Yes, uh, well, what I'm doing now is I'm in private practice now, mostly, and uh, I also teach yep. MA, psychotherapy trainees, and uh, some people on the advanced diploma level as well. And uh, in the past, I have also taught counseling psychology trainees for, towards the professional doctorate. And for sure, the other thing that has changed is how many, how many people I see per week. Right. You cannot do everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you one person with twenty-four hours, and it's also something that I think uh, it it's informing also my practice as to how I want to utilize that knowledge as well. Yeah, that's one thing. Th- there is a difference between teaching, supervising the clinical cases of others, and practicing yourself. Yeah, and also I would say that because I have quite a few years behind me now, and I I have worked in charities, I have worked in organizations, I worked in the NHS for a bit. Then I uh, I set up a low-cost community counseling service uh, some years back, um, which is not active now, but, you know, just looking also as to how what people are bringing might mm. be very different when they come through the NHS as opposed to having the luxury of being able to pay for long-term therapy yeah. privately. So that's why I wanted to address this first, because yeah. I think that that has to do with the differences as well. Yeah. So I would say that now I have reduced, the, yes, as I told you, I have reduced the number I'm seeing. Yeah. Also because I think that with, with years of practice, you... You know, you accumulate a lot. Yeah. You know, of course, you know, I have my own clinical supervisor. You know, I'm discussing things. Uh, my personal therapy has finished. Yeah. You know, I cannot be in therapy forever. What's the point? Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. right? You know, <laughs> at some point you need to complete and then realize how you're utilizing all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I felt that I just needed to... Actually, it, it was an exercise in self-care as well. Yeah. Uh, and that's something that is not just to do with my story, I think. You know, it's something that if you check the literature on any helping profession, nurses in particular, you know, they have tons of studies on burnout. Yeah. And uh, in our work as well, especially when you're working in private practice and you don't have a system around you uh, to actually, you know, just just balance things out with, you know, with your colleagues in the corridor or, you know, just your lunch break, something then it can uh, it, it can actually become too much. You right. know, I'm not going to lie. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it, it can become too much. And uh, so I have changed the way that I, I do my own kind of checklist. Yeah. You know, how many people can I see for the forthcoming, let's say, 18 months? Okay. In order to be able also to provide the best I can. Yeah. Right? Because I think that comes with experience, though. How much you have, what you have done in the past, the different things you've done. Mm. And now you're applying that experience into just working out literally how each day of the week, each week, you can mm. know what you can do. Yes, yes, very much so. And and it's not just, to be fair and honest, mm. I, it's not just a matter of hours. Yeah. It's also a matter of severity of presentations. Because also, yeah, as it just came to mind as I was saying that, is, mm. yeah, each person will require a different course of... Yes. You know, what, 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 you could say treatment, but it's not quite the case, but of yeah. sessions or whatever. Yes. And so that's going to be a different workload, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So that that is something that, you know, as, as, as a private practice practitioner, I always, nowadays, after, you know, you learn, you live yeah. and learn, you know, yeah. through trial and error. Yeah. Through, I, I check during the assessment 
what the duration of the therapy will yeah. be with somebody. You know, some people just come for three months, like yeah. 12 sessions, the same as it is in uh, NHS services. And that's enough. They just have like something, you know, yeah. going back to the CBT thing that we were talking about, that they it just started happening like yeah. a panic attack and they just want to resolve this yeah. with a bit of understanding themselves around that. So mm-hmm. not staying like purely CBT, you know, bringing existential therapy techniques or, yeah. you know, some, some stuff from, um, you know, other approaches as well. Yeah. And there are others that they, they they come and they have something that is has been with them for years. Yeah. You know, that is more like a personality trait that has been working for them, let's say, up till their mid-20s. And now in their mid-40s, they realize that it's really affecting the way that they're relating to others. Right. Uh, you cannot treat something like that in 12 weeks, yeah, obviously. Like, uh, like I discovered like with myself, you know, there's things that which I knew for years that I wasn't quite happy about or something mm. wasn't working. Mm. But it, yeah, it was until I got into my 40s when I think, hang on a second there, that was stopping me from doing what I could be doing. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess, you know, since since you acknowledge that yourself, yeah. it didn't take 12 weeks. Did it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And it might be, you know, different, uh, different modalities as well. Yeah. I might be seeing somebody for a while and then I might be suggesting that maybe you want to address this with something yeah. else or yeah. whatever it is. Uh, so it's, it's not just a matter of hours in the week. Uh, yeah. And it's also that, you know, sometimes you, you can get somebody who is really hard work. Yeah. It's somebody who has like a dual diagnosis, for example. Yeah. You know, I had a lady a few years back uh, who had uh, chronic eating disorders, mm. serious issues. Plus what I came to realize after I saw her for one and a half year, we yeah. stayed together for three and a half years, I think, that there was a personality disorder behind that as right. well. Okay. Uh, so that... It was taking a lot of my time, yeah. Uh, not just during the session, but the time that I needed afterwards to actually, you know, do her notes or you know process the way that I was feeling about things myself. Yeah, and you know sometimes provision was enough, sometimes it wasn't enough. Mm. Things like that. So the more experience you have in this profession, I think the more you find, and that's also something that I suggest to my students uh, when they're going out there for, you know, starting the private practices mm. and, st- uh, and things. Keep a balance between very complex cases mm. with loads of trauma, with, I don't know, like years of addiction or personality disorder or whatever, yeah. with uh, what I call more personal development cases. Yeah, okay. So kind of easier in terms of uh, intensity of work, as it were. Yes. But obviously, you know, not from each person's perspective, this, you know, to them it's going to be big, you know, just wanting to get of better. Course, but, of but, course, of course. But in terms of the amount of energy you're putting into it. Yes, and it's a different interaction. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a different end goal as well. I wouldn't say that I don't invest enough in my yeah. personal development clients. Yeah. I don't think that's fair on them and it's not fair yeah, on me. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get to, yeah. yeah. So, but, it's, but I was just trying to work, it, work out the what, balance yeah, yes, you're talking the, about. Yeah, well... I think that uh, it, you invest the same, yeah. but you're doing very, very different work yeah, okay. with them. So the the energy that I invest might be similar because that's what I'm trained for, to yeah. actually, you know, immerse in the story of the other and, you know, be there and be respectful and allowing them to discover themselves what it is and, you know, all the techniques that we're using yeah. in this profession. But the actual type of energy I'm going yeah. to invest is going to be very, very different. Yeah. You know, if somebody has anger outbursts yeah. and um, very difficult presentation shifting from uh, full gratitude for the therapy we have together to shouting at me wow. and things okay. like that, that's a different load than, yeah. uh, you know, I need a different kind of energy kind of balancing yeah. than with somebody who is quite involved, is very cerebral, you know, we have a very intense intellectual conversation, but has great difficulty addressing their feelings. So again, you Mm. know, the amount of input I'm going to put in is, you know, in terms of um, quantity or proportion is the same, but the quality is different. Yeah. Does this make sense? It does. Yeah. But I guess, but leading back to what you're saying about giving it as advice to your students is great because then it just keeps them sharp in all of the different ways Mm. of approaching and interacting with people. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's not just uh, it's not just about managing, you know, severe distress or aggression or as opposed to, you know, somebody who is very high functioning, but uh, 
they cannot actually decide where they want to go with life and yeah. blah, blah, blah. It's staying curious with the multitude of human experience, yeah. really. And to me, it's also means a lot, you know, just what we, what we say, it has become a motto nowadays as well. But I think it's very, very true, you know, curiosity rather than fear. Yeah. So even if somebody is really distressed, disturbed, whatever you want to call it, if you stay curious with them, yeah. you instill hope because you're doing something that others are not doing yeah. out there in the world. You know, they're or just, with them, yeah. Yeah, or with them. Yeah. yeah, you know, by default, they're going to just respond to them as... You know, as somebody who is, you know, like a lost case, yeah. cause, liability, whatever. But if you address things from a curious perspective, you know, it allows them to, to go out of their own stereotypes, so yeah. to speak. And this is where therapy starts, let's yeah. say, in more complex cases. Yeah. So d- this point you've gotten to, how would you describe it? You've mentioned it a couple of times, mm. as existential. And uh, wh- how yes. would you describe it to someone who's not heard of it before? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I consider myself existential integrative uh, psychologist and psychotherapist. And if I were to describe that to somebody who doesn't know what I'm talking about, <laughs> is, is an approach that... Uh, focuses a lot on the present and tries to see anxiety not as a, not as a pathological state, but yeah. as part of being alive. Yeah. So, you know, it draws a lot from, you know, the existential thinkers in philosophy, uh, looking at the angst that we're talking about, yeah. that, you know, we're, we need to fill the void in our life. Think of the Edvar, Edward Munch uh, picture of yeah. the scream, you know, until you find your way to actually make your life meaningful or you know finding a purpose in life yeah this anxiety that we have as as an existential given yeah you know our existence is driven by that because compared to the rest of the animal kingdom let's say we are aware of our own death yeah so we are aware of life being uncertain so the, the, there is something that you know it can be the motivating force of life if we actually manage to channel it properly yeah but if we if we don't then it will become a symptom. Yeah. So that's the way that I would describe it to people. That uh, you know, it's it's an approach that uh, allows you to look at your problems not in a non-pathological way. Yeah. And we will try to find a way to understand the meaning you're giving to things and to explore other possibilities. Mm. So that that's the way that I would put it. Oh, great. Yeah, yes. yeah, but yeah. <laughs> <Just> put it <laughs> good. <laughs> good. 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 And the integrative element is when I bring stuff from other approaches as well. So I'm not a purist, you know, I'm not just saying, you know, this is the only way to do it. And so, you know, I would be bringing some, um, some elements of the more kind of what people associate with uh, the psychotherapy world, like Freud and uh, the psychodynamic theory and trying to understand how we develop particular personality traits or complexes or tensions in our past. Sometimes I would be using some of that in order to understand yeah. something, but it, my focus is not going to stay back there forever, yeah. let's say. Yeah. Or what we said about CBT. You know, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not going to say I'm not going to use CBT because I have this very kind of funky, yeah. uh, you know, non-mainstream approach that, you know, looks against labels and categories. Yes, sometimes people want a category i yeah. cannot ignore that you know so, so sometimes so, you know you get cases of people that they feel better if you tell them well, you suffer. Got this. yes yeah. you've got this <laughs> <laughs> you know it makes it more concrete I, it, because it's a funny in society isn't it how other i was going to say people like but actually i think it's, uh, sometimes it feels imposed on us that we need to be defined by other uh, for example something like our work you know people can yes. be defined by what they do they, like, yes. they need to ask you know what do you do or uh, there's some element that it defines people, and they want to they want to know that rather than just than just being. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and you know, I think that we need to have, you know, we 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 need to have a relationship with that element too, yeah. because, you know, that's why we developed language, most probably, you know, evolutionary speaking. Why did we develop language in order to actually have some certainty around us and being able to name this as that and yeah. that as that? Yeah. And as you said very well, that you know, when when you meet somebody, yeah. usually the first two questions you're going to get is, uh, "What do you do?" Yeah, <laughs> uh, and where are you from? Yeah, <laughs> so that's yeah. already two very very clear categories yeah. there yeah. that help people at least you know at least monitor the 
suspiciousness, yeah, the uncertainty. Yeah. Or the cur- this? curiosity. Or yeah. curiosity, yeah. you know, yes, since we mentioned the word curiosity several <laughs> times. Uh, so we do need some categorization. But so the there's pro- something f- something familiar in that. So I guess yeah. wanting to know if they are they feel like someone's feeling like they're suffering from something is yeah good for them to know if it's if yeah. it has a de- definition perhaps. Yeah, and I mean you know if we are to just leave the you know the the vicissitudes of the psyche yeah. uh, aside for a minute, think of uh, when you need to go to your GP. Yeah, good point. <laughs> <laughs> you know you you want an answer. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not going to just ignore that if if it's important for somebody. Yeah. But I would not. Ju- my approach in general is not that I will uh, use that all the time as a rule of thumb. Sure. Because then you're just you know you you're just looking at things very very medically very very clinically, and the soul is much more complex than a physical symptom. Anyway, okay, this brings us back to the you know your journey to get here. Because yes. of all the different things you learned, and this is exactly. why you've you've kept changing direction, not not changing direction as such, because it's all uh, broadly the same direction, uh, mm. but uh, just all the different strings to your bow you've added. So, how do you find the results that you're getting now with the people with it? <laughs> Interesting question. People like working with me, and that's really nice to see. Uh, the results are that people very very often quite amazed that they start the journey of psychotherapy in order to just get rid of something. Yeah. <laughs> and they they end up knowing more about themselves in a more kind of holistic fashion. That's uh, interesting you put it that way and that because I I guess so how, how do you describe that they come to see you to let go of something that you say or uh, because what I was going to mm. uh, what came to me was that I wanted to fix something yes 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 very much yeah and, I, but, I said uh, get rid but yeah, yes yeah. it's the same thing uh, but then in hindsight it's probably the wrong kind of expression for it because you know it's still part of me yes Yes, and so it's, yeah. So you then you, you said it perfectly that in, in the end, because it's natural then that in the end of the process, they're going to learn more about themselves. So instead of letting go of something or fixing something, all they've done is learn more about themselves and then yes. embraced everything. Embraced everything. Embraced who they are. You know the, how they can be in the world. Uh, you know just being gentler with them, themselves as well as to you know how they engage in you know in social situations and things like yeah. that. You know, trusting themselves a little bit more. So yeah. I would say that the result is is that. Yeah. Because the symptom usually goes away pretty quickly. Yeah. Usually. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think we we discussed already the distinction between something that is a personality trait that has yeah. been with somebody throughout their lives, as opposed to, you know, a symptom like, you know, like an anxiety issue or, yeah. or, or, or an impulse issue like you know, being addicted to something and things yeah. like that. Um, so usually that that you can manage pretty quickly is what you do with somebody after the symptom is gone. Yeah. You know, this thing that the tendency to either get rid of something or fix something and yeah. then, okay, for sure, you know, you, there is some space created from that. And then yeah. what do you do with this space? How do you feel your existence going back to the notion of, uh, you know, existential therapy? Yeah. How, you know, when that is gone. Yeah. What will you do with the with the with the space that you have created for ah. your personality, so to speak? Yeah. Well, hopefully expand into it and then create something positive and that, something you can build with your life. Yes, exactly, and also or build you in your life. Build in your life, and also you know you create more possibilities. Yeah. You know because whatever behavior or personality trait uh, somebody comes to work with. Yeah. This was filling up time. Yeah. And yeah, then, yeah, you know, in many ways. So when that is not there, of course, it's still part of somebody. Yeah. Yes, because they experience that. But you know, it goes yeah. back to what we're saying—the distinction, you know, where we put the the weight in terms of the scales, you know, past yeah. or present. Yes, it's going to be with you all, always. Yeah. You know, what what brought me to this profession? What particular difficulty brought me to this yeah. profession? It's always going to be with me. Yeah. For sure, but the space that I have created, not engaging in that particular behavior that I was engaging back in my youth, yeah, allowed me to explore different ways of relating to others, checking what I want to do with my life, or things like that. Yeah, I will never be completely free from that, or you know, I will never get rid of that completely. Yeah, right? no, likewise, yeah. 
yeah. but are able to give your focus and attention to positive and constructive st- steps forward into yeah. a pursuit or journey into a, you know the next phase of your life. Absolutely. Or, or whenever something, one of our demons revisits us, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just to be fair and <laughs> honest, yeah. at least you have more more self-awareness and more knowledge as to how to approach this. Yes. So you, Because we all have tendencies, you know, some of us are more anxious, some of us are more introverted, some yeah. of us are, you know, more addiction prone, yeah. how, some of us are more depression prone, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. So you, I think it's, it's, it's quite important, actually, to stress that out, that, you know, it's, it, it's not a panacea, you know, it's not going to just go completely. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, of course. But for sure, it it will create you enough space, you, whoever, plural, to actually explore different ways of relating. Yeah. And whenever it lurks back in, you can you can invite it yeah. to actually have a chat with it, yeah. realize what's going on. Yeah. Jung used to say for depression that uh, consider, I don't know if I'm citing this right or not, but the meaning is there. Yeah. Yes, so yeah, probably I'm paraphrasing <laughs> that. If, uh, if depression knocks on your door, yeah. and it's this kind of, uh, it cons- it's, it's like a figure, you know, I remember that there was a figure next to the quote, dark, skinny figure, mm. uh, like, um, like an old aunt or yeah. something. Yeah. And, and he said, you know, if, if that old aunt, old skinny aunt, anyway, yeah. Uh, knocks on your door just uh, don't shut the door in panic yeah invite her in for a cup of tea and listen to what she has to say yeah and i find that quote brilliant yeah because it's not you know i think that this is why people uh, quite often you know they they despair themselves after the first time that they had therapy and it didn't work yeah that since this didn't go away, yeah. I might as well not engage in a journey of self-discovery yeah. at all. Yeah. And it's a shame because <laughs> because we, we you know we we all unique and even our dark uh, dark sides. Yeah. Uh, they have something to to tell us and also something to give you know to others as well in a sense. You know, yeah, really because there's a, a kind of a shared experience and exactly. also something that people uh, will have felt. Mm. And uh, they've just not heard it from somebody else before. And that's kind of reassuring to know that it's a shared experience. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And um, it's interesting you you brought that up because one of the main functions in uh, in uh, group therapy sessions is exactly that, is that the, what Yalom talks about, the installation of hope that happens because of that, realizing that we're not alone in this. Yeah. It's not. It's not just me who is experiencing this. You know, there, there are other people as well, and that alone yeah. instills hope in people. Yeah, yeah, and to know that, uh, yeah, it's not. It's not just you. That's just a huge you know, part of lots of you know perspectives on life. Yes, very much so. Yeah. So does that uh, bring us on to uh, any changes you felt in terms of the people you've hmm. seen over time? Has there been any comparison with? Uh, I guess this kind of relates to, as we're maybe getting, getting on to how any changes in the world as a whole. Um, but yeah, so how have things changed with the people you've seen from back then to now? Yeah, I have to say that uh, when, we're the, when we were preparing for, uh, for this uh, chat, yeah. and you mentioned that you were interested also to see, you know, the differences. Yeah. Uh, uh, with regards to people's mental health then and now, let's say, yeah. you know, I found that question fascinating. Yeah. And, um, you know, th- there are so many levels you can, you know, you can approach this with, mm. and I will try to be brief. Overall, I would say that loads of things have not changed. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, you know, the, the difficulty that people have admitting that something is not working. Yeah. You know, in their personality traits, in uh, in the way that they work out their relationships, or the way that they are at work, whatever it yeah. is, that hasn't changed yeah. <laughs> uh, that much. Yeah. But on the other hand, for sure, you know, compared to when I started, yeah, there is an extra acceptance and understanding of what the helping professions do. Yeah. So you know, there is less of a stigma. Okay. Uh, as to getting help. Yeah. And that is something that has to do also with, you know, successful, let's say, 
campaigns around mental health in general and yeah. raising awareness and reducing the stigma and what have you. That's the positive bit. <laughs> um, but for sure, still, there is, I think that this is going to take, uh, you know, uh, generations to actually really, really be open about yeah. this. That's, uh, and, and also, you know, in a, in a, you know, in a every day, like, you know, the, the tendency we have a small talk and, you know, not yeah. saying, you know, where we are exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so, you know, you're taking a big breath there, yeah? Because uh, I guess I have a kind of this trait of when I see people of saying, how are you doing? I probably say it a couple of times when they're really points of when mm. we're talking and it feels like I'm kind of repeating myself. But yeah, I, I do kind of want to break through that sometimes and yes. see how people are doing. Yes, really, really doing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, not just yeah. talk about the weather or whatever it is. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think that this is going to take a while. Um, but for sure, you know, compared to how it was... I don't know, late 90s, let's say, mm. it's it's different. Yeah. You know, before it was like, uh, you know, you had people saying, why do you think I'm mad? Yeah. And I need help. Yeah. Uh, well, now people will realize that, you know, it's not, you know, you don't have to be completely, you know, out in touch, out of touch with reality in order to actually go and see somebody and, yeah. you know, have like a safe, confidential space to talk about things. Yeah. That's on a positive note. On a more negative note, yeah. I would say that... People are much more anxious. Yeah. They are much more insecure. And that is is not just to do with their internal state, yeah. obviously. Yeah. It has to do with the the way that the world is going in yeah. general. You know, what you know, the, the there is more insecurity in general that that will tap into existing, let's say, traumas or difficulties and things like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean an example that came to mind is that uh uh, over the weekend at the Latitude Festival, I spoke to an artist and we were talking about his writing process and how much of it has been cathartic. Mm. Uh, but we kind of got onto a, a subject with uh, music that he says, the music he listened to, a lot of the, the music he listens to to relax came before 9-11. Mm, interesting. And the music, the music, Very interesting. The music that, that, that's been created since then, at least the styles of music he listens to uh, since then has been different. Mm. And, uh, you know, like when I was talking to you about this interview... Uh, when I kind of mentioned around this topic, one of the differences I noticed in myself the past couple of years is living in London and outside London. Yes. In, in nature, it's just obviously different. And of in course. London, uh, it, it's course. always been in more in a more intense frequency. Yes. But uh, I, as I notice as I walk around a bit recently, there is something else, a different edge to a kind of anxiety. Or Absolutely. it's not just the fast pace and you know people outside London. I think Londoners are. Uh, not friendly. I don't think that's true because if you break the ice with someone, you know, most people are friendly here. But there is this kind of shield people put up when they're out and about. Yes. But there is just a different something Vibration. else. Yeah, something yeah. else is going on for sure. Well, yes, and you know, even if you consider the you know the recent events. Yeah. You know, acid attacks, the Grenfell yeah. Tower. Yeah. You know, the, the the how often would you hear helicopters after the after the terrorist incidents and things like that? Of course, people are going to actually internalize that. Yeah. And uh, and also you know financial security and things. Yeah, like that. that's right. That's, that's that's what came to mind. There's pressures now, and the cost of living. That's a big one. You know, that's I think that seems to be the biggest thing when you speak mm. to people now is how much they have to do to survive or what how, how much things cost and that kind of thing. Yeah, and I think that this is this is where I'm taking my profession out there in the world somehow. Yeah, you know, it's one thing uh, working. You know, I, I think I said this earlier in our conversation as well in private practice with people who can afford yeah. paying, you know, the the amount of fee that, you know, I still have a sliding scale, but yeah. it's a lot of money. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's a lot of yeah. money, uh, as opposed to somebody who cannot afford this. Yeah. And that's why back uh, a few years back, I, you know, I was seeing uh, people on the more or less, let's say the, the lowest kind of average yeah. of, therapies, healing, treatments, whatever, you know, but, but, but I'm just, you know, staying and I still have a sliding scale, but still that was uh, was not something that uh, other people could afford at all. Yeah. And that's why I was uh, doing these sessions in the community center and, you, you know, starting with five pounds an hour. Yeah. But I cannot live on five pounds an hour. Yeah, so obviously. you have to get to a point in your life where it can be sustainable for you to Z provide it. Yeah, and I think that this is where, you know, each where each therapist's own 
ideology and politics and things yeah, like that exactly. I, will, I will be coming in yeah you know I've got friends who just work in the just I shouldn't say just because that's not fair but they, they work in the NHS yeah. and uh, and they don't have a private practice because they believe in you know just giving more yeah straight into you know into the community through the you know the NHS as a free provider. provision yeah. yeah and the free provision but at the same time that that comes with very very long waiting lists yeah. and you know the, big workload big workload and people who at times as well by the time that they are seen the 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 whole kind of caseload has um, the, the, the no the case characteristics have has changed yeah and then are you doing really good or are you doing more harm than good yeah. because you know the the real trauma was like 18 months ago yeah yeah, I mean, I did, that was one of the angles I looked at, and it wasn't that long, fortunately, but it's still a good two or three months. Yes. And, uh, you know, after, I was wondering at that time, you know, the, the, you first speak to them, and there's a, you know, a series of questions they ask. Mm. And I don't know if uh, there's a difference in the waiting list if you say, you know, I am suicidal, and, you know, yes. would, would, yes. you know would, would you get sorted out or see someone sooner? I don't know. Uh, very possibly. Okay. Very possibly. And uh, this, is, this goes back to the categories that we're talking okay. about, if you think about it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, some, some people would be even people who have been part of the mental health system for a very long time. They would be using things like that, even if they're not suicidal yeah. at times, in order to get the attention of professionals faster, which is really sad because yeah. it shouldn't be like that. You know, the, but this is where we're at, you know, austerity cuts. There you it's go. kind of like that, even seeing your GP, that uh, yes. that uh, people, because you have to get a normal appointment or, get, or see him tomorrow, the thing you have to say to see him tomorrow is something, oh, it's a big problem. Yes, yeah, well, well but since you mentioned the GP, when I, when I first actually changed GP because I was unhappy a few years back uh, with my GP further down the road, and I moved to another practice up here because... They they still had like drop in and um, you, know, you could see the GP on an emergency appointment yeah. and see your own GP and not somebody from the triage team. Yeah. And these were my reasons that why I moved to this practice. Yeah. And then like see, I think six months down the line, all this went. Yeah. And then if I if I don't have an emergency now and I ask for an appointment, usually I will get an appointment in. Two weeks, yeah. ten, wow. between ten and fifteen days, which yeah. is horrendous. <laughs> it's horrendous. Yeah, yeah. So there's no point, really. Yeah, there's no point, really. Yeah. Um, so th- this is kind of the you know if you are to take the macro, yeah, uh, societal kind of factors yeah. that affect you know how people are and how they you know what sort of presentations you get nowadays and things like that. Yeah. I feel I should also. I don't know how much time we have. Um, no, if, yeah. It's, it's okay. Yeah. I know that the, there are loads of professionals in the IAPT service that they have taken a lot into consideration what problems people bring, yeah. and they try to diversify a little bit how they how they do that compared to when IAPT was introduced. But there is a tendency in the IAPT services to mm. just categorize everything as either anxiety or depression yeah, yeah, yeah. you say that <laughs> you say that with some conviction so i guess you you can relate to that or um, well no just uh, i can understand why they yes. uh, why that is you know that you know, or yeah i can believe that happening basically yes yeah but i find that extremely problematic yeah exactly i mean there's so many different facets to exactly how people are and how you know why they are like that yeah and this is where you're missing the person behind the presentation yeah and this is you know speaking of this you know the notion of categories as you know part of our linguistic yeah, exactly. mantle as humans <laughs> that we do need it but at the same time you know it can it can be used and can be abused as anything yeah. else and when you're just using these two big overarching categories yeah it's very easy to to miss yeah. the person the story and you know, and I believe also that it creates a lot of bias for professionals as well. Yeah. And now I'm going to see, you know, an anxiety case. Yeah. I'm going to see a depression yeah. case. Uh, it's, yeah. So it's that layer of how the definition is applied. Whereas I guess when you go see someone, perhaps on a private basis, yes. who has uh, experience yes. in more of the yes. uh, different facets of uh, therapy or ways of seeing people, they're able mm. to see them and say, okay, they're 
like this because of this, this, and this. It's not. It's not just one. No, definition. it's not. Ju- yes, it's not just one definition. And I think that this is where, when you ask me about my approach, the integrative element is yeah, coming in. You yeah. know, integrating elements of different uh, therapeutic approaches or theories as well into yeah. that. You know, realizing that. Okay, my main modality is existential. And I trained in this. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I made a very conscious choice training in this as opposed to something else. But uh, at the same time, if I just stay with that, you know, I might miss also the other person's needs. Yeah. That they're coming through in the way that they're talking about. Yeah. You know, their stories, their symptoms, whatever. So, yeah, I think it's very, you know, the, the, that's, that's the privilege of private practice. Yeah. Let's face it, that yeah. you can actually do that. Yeah. I should say that, uh, you know, th- there have been, there are services around that they provide uh, low-cost private hmm. uh, therapy as well. Um, and I, I just referred somebody uh, to a low-cost counseling service in Croydon, for okay. example. So th- there are ways around it, yeah. but people will have to look for it's them. It's a bit not so obvious. No, it's not so obvious. You know, there, you know, there tends to be like a, again, a categorical distinction yeah. between like uh, NHS with a waiting list of three months, if you're lucky, or yeah. more. And uh, and private practice where you have to actually add that to your stress of London life yeah. and uh, finances, <laughs> but then at least yeah. have the have the luxury of you know going into depth and taking as much mm. time as you need with with things. Yeah, yeah. At least the uh, option is there, which is a good, yes. good way to see it. Absolutely. And some of us, including myself, you know, we operate on sliding scales for that yeah. reason. And for yeah. me as well, I think that one of I mentioned the burned out the burnout earlier, but it, it was not just a matter of burnout, I think. It was also making sure that I I make my money elsewhere as well, like in yeah. teaching. Yeah. And then I can provide even free counseling in my community involvements mm. and things like that. Okay, now I'm I'm I I've got quite a bit on my plate, you know, because I'm completing a big writing project as well and yeah. things like that. But overall you know, I would provide free counseling yeah. because I make enough money through teaching if and my private to. practice. Yeah. But that's my ideology. Yeah. You know, you you know, you can get other practitioners that they would never do that. Yeah. Or others that they prefer to just, you know, be in the NHS and you know, just just do that and provide from that. Yeah. There, there are different ways around it. And I think, you know, that, that goes back to, you know, one's one's personal values, ethos, politics. Well, I mean, it's good then that people, there are the range of people uh, that are able to provide it from each different angle. So that... Well, absolutely. Uh, And, you know, I think at the end of the day, we we always need to remember that the therapeutic relationship is again a relationship. You know, there are matches and there are mismatches. You know, you will have to actually check what works for you. Yeah, from both sides. From both sides, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up because I, you know, that's also something that I say again to my students quite a bit. It's like the first session in particular, yeah. and sometimes two, three sessions in, it's it's a mutual assessment. Yeah, exactly. You know, we're both assessing each other. Can we actually work together? Because, yeah. you know, it's a trust exercise. Yeah. Counseling is a trust exercise. I've noticed that from providing massages is that there's been times where probably it wasn't going to work from both sides, but mm. I, there's been times maybe I knew I'd see somebody once mm. and that'd be fine but then for longer periods of time you, you knew you know that it's not going to work that you're, yes. you're you know you're not the one for them or yes uh, and or it's just not going to work yeah you know the two of you together so it's good to be able to have a uh, a means of being able to spot that in that first session to yeah. uh to analyze it Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, and also I think it's an exercise in humility yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking that, yeah, you don't yes. have all the answers. Yes. Yeah, then you may- <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic chat. Yeah, fantastic. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. So, uh, I, th- I think we've you know, covered everything. You know, just, uh, you know, are you, are you optimistic? Do you, how do you th- see things unfolding? I mean, that's a, kind of a big question to throw at you at the, at the end there. <laughs> but that's, that's another interview altogether, isn't it? But then, it? Uh, you know, so you, you, you happy, you happy right now? So, you know, you said you're, yeah. you, know, you, you had this sort of workload and these, you know, bit of juggling going on. I'm happy right now. Uh, I have this big quest as to how I can use, utilize this knowledge to raise ecological awareness for people in communities. Okay. That's, that's my big aspiration. I'm quite optimistic about that. 
it's still quite fuzzy, you know. I'm not, you know, it's not clear, obviously. But uh, this is one thing I've known about you for quite a long time because mm. you are on top of things like this. For example, this recent uh, Grenfell Tower. Yes. There is this group for complementary therapists yes, that exactly. were doing things like this, and you are exactly. you are you are on the case with that. So yes. you know, you are, you are at the forefront of what, well, uh, from my perspective, uh, of things like this, which is great. Yes, but, but I I believe in people and I believe yeah. in human connection. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I think it's quite important like, to to stay engaged, yeah. you know, not to just get into into a routine of then you know just dehumanizing yourself and then you're just doing this because out of habit. Exactly. You know? it's, yeah. That yeah, I, I'm I'm very good at that. Yeah. You know, it's no, it's there's more and plus more you can learn about yourself as well yes, by doing it. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, in that kind of environment and absolutely and recognizing your own limits. Yeah. Since, since you brought that up with with Grenfell Tower is. We all need to actually acknowledge again when we are ready to actually serve and when we're not. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, and that's why it was quite important to have like a team around us yeah. of people to actually support each other as well before we could support somebody else. And I think that that's... And somebody who comes from that yes. experience. Yes. Well, thank you. Thanks for your time and uh, thank you for the conversation. It's something, it kind of went as I... I didn't know quite what to expect. I knew it'd be nice and I knew uh, you'd be sharing lots of information about yourself and what you're doing. And uh, I'm really grateful. Thank you. I'm very grateful that you've given me the time to actually share <coughs> that with uh, with you uh, and actually reflect on where I'm at at this particular moment in time as well. Thank yeah. you very much for the opportunity. Oh, it's a pleasure. I know that for myself, like you know, these times when things haven't been so good for me in the past, it's kind of coincided and probably been partly to do with being kind of isolated, isolated, yes. isolating myself, and it's mm. only mm. as uh, I've gotten out, out and about again and f- feeling better that you re- realize. Hang on a second, it's from the conversations, from the reflections that uh, things are helped, <laughs> basically. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and I think that this is this is something that we it's very very easy to forget. Since yeah. and I think we're just revisiting the last question for. And one also, moment. what we're talking about in London as well, like how, yes. so these people we see that you know from this difference in vibration and frequency being in london is that we're surrounded by people but so many people are alone yes yes very much so very much yeah so, so uh that has uh, those finding those ways of encouraging people to get out and meet people that's one way that can absolutely help them. Yeah. absolutely and uh you know just just engage in the, we all need to be recognized yeah and you cannot do that uh when you're just in your flat or in your room and yeah. uh, you you don't dare going out and you know yeah. even saying hello to you know the grocery store man yeah. or woman or whatever yeah, exactly you know what i mean yeah, yeah. it's and and uh, and and that that's part of our challenge in big cities anyway yeah you know it's, it's part of the nature of it i guess yes. being there yeah yes very much so uh, and so, you know, I think we, you know, by doing things like that and even having a conversation like that also for, you know, um, the Phoenix uh, listeners yeah. as well, it's just, you know, just, just reminding ourselves, yeah. you know, how important it is to actually reach out. We all need some time to recharge in solitude, no yeah. question about that. Oh, for sure, but there's a balance, isn't there? But there is a balance. Uh, yeah, yeah. And usually what happens is that, you know, with more insecurity, uh, in, in you know in times like this, then it's it's very very easy to just uh, you know just just retreat completely in yeah. isolation rather than just retreat to recharge and then go out and reconnect. I think what I did was uh, it's like a big pendulum swing swinging. Mm. I was too far the other way. I was mm. out and about too often yes. for too long, and then what I ended up doing is swinging too far the other way of doing nothing for too long, and so yes. slowly then the pendulum. Swings yes. are less and less, and yes. so I'm finding that balance now between yes. in and out. Basically. Yeah, in and out, retreating yeah. and uh, reconnecting, basically. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can totally relate to that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And uh, so, yeah, that's why I'm grateful uh, and happy to be, you know, resurrecting this Mental Health Matters podcast for Phoenix because this is kind of the conversation that I wanted mm. to get out uh, for the listeners. So, uh, so I'm glad that this is the first one, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it's going to continue. Well, looking forward to seeing how it's going to continue as well. You know, <laughs> keep me posted, please. I will do. Yes. Yeah, you'll be uh, yeah, first to know. So yeah, I'll be all posted and stuff on the uh, Phoenix FM website and uh, okay. all the episodes. And yeah, looking forward to how continue okay (laughs) thank you elizabeth thank you graham fantastic